Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. High Kicks and Misdemeanors by Janet Berliner Most things that happen in Vegas stay in Vegas because no one outside the city would believe them. Typical of that is the truly tall tales of Willie and Legs Cleveland and the Ostrich Army. The story begins with two men killed under similar circumstances at Country Club Towers, a high-rise that Legs called home. One man who lived in the apartment above Legs bled out in the elevator as a result of two deep gouges in his stomach. Legs, who discovered the body, noticed that he was wearing a Say No to Yucca Mountain t-shirt. Several days later, a handyman and Legs' employee was killed in the identical manner. The cops, only vaguely interested since the men had no particular claim to celebrity, failed to notice that the second man wore the same t-shirt. Legs tried to point out the coincidence. Instead of gratitude, they hauled him down to the station and badgered him to tell them what he knew about the dead men. You're not pinning this one on me, he said. Everyone knows I'm a lover, not a killer. Not that he hadn't caused a few deaths in his time, like that gorgeous chorus girl in Memphis and the Zulu dancers in Laughlin End. But that was different. He hadn't meant for anything to happen to them. When the cops let him go, warning him not to leave town, he felt fear at the pit of his gut. It was not something he'd experienced often. For a few days, he tried focusing on his search for new clients. As a self-styled talent scout with a penchant for long-legged Corrines, thus his nickname Legs, his search took him to strip shows and stripper shows, to secondary casino acts and bordellos, but for once, his heart wasn't in it. In need of company and sound advice, he went downtown to find the only person he trusted. His great granduncle, Way Out Willie, so-called because he played by his own rules. He was beholden to none and trusted nobody, with two exceptions, himself and his ostrich spirit guide. He took pride in his full-blooded Paiute heritage. Even though he hadn't set foot on Indian territory since, at the age of 12, he left his family to seek his spirit guide. Willie loved Las Vegas, mostly because it was a city where the culture of anonymity was God. He shared his innermost thoughts with no one and kept to himself the business he did for Mo Dalits of the Cleveland mob. As a private joke between them, Willie, whose Indian name was Nati Tohakera, took on the name Will Cleveland. He drove for the mob and learned where the bodies were buried and was the most trusted and feared loan shark in town. Sometimes he gave loans and washed them away. Other times he had bones broken. Legs found Willie downtown playing in a small Texas hold'em game. After a stint at the back of the sports book, Willie's office, he got the old man a complimentary corned beef sandwich from the deli, waited for him to be cashed out, and took him over to the towers. The day was November 16, 1999, which Willie swore was his 150th birthday. They sat on the balcony, looking at the stratosphere and the strip beyond while Willie chomped on his sandwich, washed it down with a bottle of dark beer, and listened to legs. Nothing to worry about, Willie said. You think? Willie belched his confirmation and cleaned his teeth with his nail. When he was done, he took his black book of debtors out of his pocket and tore it into shreds. What the hell are you doing? Legs asked, watching the gathering heap of outstanding markers from God, Satan, and half of the population of Las Vegas. Willie laughed. Now you listen to me, he said. You don't have to worry about anything. He pointed at the shuttle to Area 51's Groom Lake. The pair watched it circle and head towards the Janet Air Terminal. What you need to know is that my time is done. They're coming to get me. Keep the 50K you skimmed from me. Give the money in my mattress to our people and stay away from the road to Rachel. He laughed at Legs' expression. What happens to your ostrich? Legs asked, treating the affair as a joke. 
probably come to you, Willie said. Treat him right, or he'll get you. He can be mean and stupid. Kick a man to death, right easy. Run forty miles an hour. You know, I don't believe in spirit guides, Legs said. What if I don't? You'll be knee-deep in shit, Willie said. Ostrich shit. Around midnight, a white jeep Cherokee stopped in the street down below and let down a rear ramp. A tall, slender woman in camouflage coveralls stepped out of the jeep and entered the building. Let her in, Willie said, as the buzzer sounded. Legs knew better than to argue, even when she wheeled Willie out of the apartment and within minutes pushed him up the ramp and into the truck. As a Cherokee pulled away, the street light illuminated a decal of an ostrich on the back bumper. By noon of the following day, Legs called downtown to see if the old man had gone directly there, but no one had seen him. He decided that Willie was doing a favor for one of his mob friends, or there was always the possibility that senility had finally done what senility does. Besides, reporting a missing person was not a comfortable idea. He remained mostly distracted by his own problems until, catching sight of the afternoon Janet air shuttle, he remembered that Willie had said when they'd last watched one together. They're coming to get me, adding later. Stay away from the road to Rachel. Never one to obey orders, Legs walked a mile or so to the closest rental car company and was soon on his way to Area 51, though what he hoped to do when he got there was anybody's guess. Radio on full blast, he smoked part of a joint, munched on a candy bar, enjoyed the winter sunshine. He felt good until he saw what looked like an unmarked cop car closing in on him. Glancing at the speedometer, he slowed down, below the speed limit and veered onto Highway 375, which would take him to Groom Lake Road. The road was bumpy, the cops stayed behind him. After about 12 miles, with the cops still behind him, he swerved to the right, down a narrow road, unmarked except for a broken down shack and a sign that read, Doris Place, Gentlemen Welcome. The car behind him made a U-turn. Legs gave a sigh of relief and kept driving until he saw a very large animal lying across the road. He put on his brakes and was about to get out of a car when a white Jeep Cherokee, like the one that had taken Willie, hurtled toward him. He sat and watched the Jeep stop on the other side of the big bird. The same tall woman he'd seen the night of Willie's disappearance stepped from the passenger side, holding a gun in her hand. The legs, who knew little about guns, the weapon looked real. A man who dressed in camouflage stepped out of the driver's side, strode over to the animal, and kicked it. He realized suddenly that they were the camo dudes who patrolled Area 51, but since he had neither a camera nor a weapon, they would probably just ream him out and call the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department. This one's dead, the man said. Told you he wouldn't make it to the road after what? I shot into him. He looked at Legs. Dead as you'll be if you don't do what you're told. The woman pushed Leg toward the passenger side of his car and got behind the wheel. You were supposed to stun it, not kill it, she said through the open window. The man laughed. What's one ostrich, more or less? The woman turned to Legs. As for you, Mr. Cleveland, she said. How? Maybe your uncle might have told you a little too much about our business. Know what I mean? Her laugh was not pleasant. The man roped together the legs of the dead ostrich and looped it around the bumper of the van. Hope you're into ostriches, Mr. Cleveland, the woman said. Dumb creatures. With Willie gone, someone's got to take care of them. Within twenty minutes, the van pulled up in front of a huge barn, barricaded by a wide iron bar. The man removed the bar and legs was shepherded inside. Corralled in the middle was a large flock of ostriches. The smell was gross. He gagged. You'll get accustomed to it, the woman said. Legs prayed silently for the cop, who had been following him, vowing to God that if he got out of this, he'd give Willie's money to the Paiutes, Never gamble again or booze, never. All right, Mr. Cleveland, the woman said. Time to meet our soldiers. They've been restless of late. You'll have to calm them down so that they follow instructions. Who knows? If you're good at your job, if they don't kill you, maybe we'll show you how our other brigades. Noah got it right when he saved the animals. Hoping to control his fear, legs turned and focused on the troop of birds. The ostriches looked calm enough to him. Most of them had their heads spread flat on the sand. The rest milled around in almost listless manner, nudging one another occasionally. They were just like Willie had described during his interminable recounting of his misspent youth. 
According to Willie, his search for a spirit guide had led him to Walker Lake. While sleeping under a bush, he was awoken from a peyote dream by the poking head of a strange and hideous animal nuzzling him in the armpit. The animal looked like a 300-pound sage hen. Its skinny long legs and bluish-pink neck were devoid of plumage, its large body covered by odd grayish-brown feathers, its undersized head marked by beady onyx eyes, which, he was to learn, were larger than its brain. The bird, for that was what Willie determined it was, stared at him and refused to move. When Willie pushed at it, it skittered to one side, but made no attempt to fly. He would have understood if he'd known anything about ostriches. However, he did not, yet. What he did know was that he could not embarrass his family by going home. Not then, not ever. Thus began a lifetime of adventure for Nati Toakera, a.k.a. Way Out Willie. First he walked to Austin, Nevada, where he met a pretty young woman by the name of Dora, who gave him shelter at her place of employment, the larger of Austin's two whorehouses. He quickly became a favorite of the rental ladies, who were quite happy to feed him in exchange for yard work and Indian tall tales. On his 16th birthday, they even took it upon themselves to initiate him into manhood in the pleasantest of fashions. Natty and Dora became a couple. She continued plying her trade but pleasured him on the side, and what spare time she had, she taught him to read, a skill that allowed him to learn about his ostriches. Of most significance to him was the fact that his spirit guy was not unique, and he determined that he would earn the money to buy several more. He did, and Willie's ostrich farm and whorehouse was born. All went well for him until his ostrich conspired to lead its fellows away from Willie's farm and whorehouse and onto the road that led from Austin to Belmont. Like a revolutionary army, 63 strong, they marched off, leaving Willie no longer the owner of an ostrich farm. Rather than search for them, he sold his farm, split the money with Dora, who said nothing about being with child, and took off for Las Vegas to become a gambler. The woman had called them our soldiers, yet Willie had said they never attacked unless provoked or trained like thought. Maybe he could find a way to free them, but what was the point if they killed whatever they'd been trained to kill? Or if they killed him? Either way, it seemed to him he was a dead man. He was still staring at the birds when he had a door open behind him. The man stood by the barn door they'd entered through while the woman stood near a storage closet he hadn't noticed before. She had stripped off her camo outfit and was standing in a pair of short shorts and pulling on one of those white suits that emergency workers wear when cleaning chemical spills. You got some pair of legs. Let me out of here and I'll make you a star. Zippering the suit, she came toward him. She held a large syringe in her right hand. Praying it wasn't meant for him, he squinted at the name attached to her suit and said, Ava, perfect. Why would you want to be here when you could be a headliner? You're a funny man, Mr. Cleveland. She came closer. Legs, he said. Call me Legs. All right, Legs. Let's talk. What did Willie tell you about his work here? Nothing. Nothing? That's hard to believe. Believe it. For a moment, the woman was silent. Lex figured he had nothing to lose by asking what it was they were doing to the ostriches to turn them into killing machines and why they were doing it. He was as good as dead anyway. Might as well know what he was dying for. Willie told you nothing? Nothing. Tell me something, Mr. Cleveland. Legs, do you also have an ostrich spirit guide? Leg shook his head. I don't believe in that stuff. She looked at the syringe in her hand. He did, she said. It kept him safe in there. Legs could feel the sweat running down his neck. What did he do here? He asked again. He worked with the ostriches. Taught us about them. Why? She held up the syringe. He wanted to live to be old, she said, and keep his own teeth. There was a price to pay, and he paid it. It was all Legs could do not to reach out and knock the syringe out of her hand. I don't mind false teeth, he said. She laughed. There has to be some other reason, Legs began. There was. Me. I'm Dora's great-granddaughter. Aren't you afraid I'll tell people? What? That we're training an army of killer ostriches? You've got to be kidding. How much time do I have to spend here? as much as we say. In his mind, Legs heard old Willie telling him to behave. He saw only one realistic possibility open to him. He would work on Ava, which wouldn't be the worst punishment in the world. She did have great gams, and who knows, maybe she could sing. 
She pointed at a loft over the barn. There's a mattress up there, a pillow, a blanket, and a computer. You can use one, I assume. Without waiting for an answer, she said, Start learning about ostriches. Oh, and say hello to Willie. Willie? The man grinned. See you later if there's anything left of you to see, he said. And he and the woman walked out of the barn. Legs heard the bar falling into place and felt the warm trickle of urine down his legs. He had forgotten how cold it could get out in the high desert at night. Shivering, he made his way up to the loft, followed by one ostrich. He lit the kerosene lamp they'd left up there and covered himself with a horsehair blanket. The portable computer was on the mattress along with spare batteries. Next to the lamp was an old brass urn. He opened it up, hoping it had held liquor, but it was filled with ashes. I fucked up, Will, he said, knowing at once that he was looking at what was left of his great-granduncle. That you did, Willie's voice came from the ostrich. I told you not to take the road to Rachel. Legs knew he'd lost his mind. He was talking to a spirit guide and an invisible dead Indian. You're stuck with us now, Willie said. The collected wisdom of our people has to be passed along. You'll have to be the conduit. You can pass on information about those things down there. Careful. Don't want to insult my buddy. How about you start checking the computer? First, Legs found out why the ostriches were so silent. Apparently the males hissed and grunted, but just during mating season, when their necks turned blue. They could only kick forward like the rockets. Their food was grasses and bugs and small pebbles to help their digestion. Their average weight was 350 pounds, yet they ran like the wind. Legs was growing tired. Before turning off the computer, he looked at the day's local headlines. More than 700 Nevada test site workers or their survivors were reopening cases linked to radioactive materials here at this federal facility northwest of Las Vegas. Lovely, Legs like said. They'll stop me to death or burn me to death. Willie chuckled. Sleep well, kid, he said. Happy dreams. He looked down at his charges. Two of them had separated from the others. The male's neck had turned blue. They were doing a bizarre dance around each other, and ugly as they were, they were clearly getting ready to mate. He laughed despite his circumstances, lay down and fell into a heavy, dream-filled sleep. The first was about his attempt to build a chorus line out of a group of Zulu warriors he brought from Africa. Their performance had become a bloodbath when their war dance, rooted in their collective unconscious, took over. The second dream was Busby Berkeley's choreographed march through town from the Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland barn movie, Babes in Arms. He awoke to an entrepreneurial epiphany. Ostrich rockets, high-stepping it down, Fremont Street to the March of the Wooden Soldiers. Like Russell Market's original rockets, they wore fa military uniforms designed by Vincent Minnelli, wide leg white sailor pants, fitted red jackets and high black hats topped with jaunty white feathers. They moved in one perfect line. He could see them in his mind's eye, moving in precise circles to form shapes that fit together like a puzzle. Standing sideways, they acted as if they'd been hit by a blast from a cannon and fell down, one by one, each partially on top of the dancer in front. Like dominoes, they descended upon one another until the final dancer fell onto a huge red velvet cushion. It would be hypnotic. Hey, Uncle Willie, like said, looking over at the urn and feeling only slightly ridiculous. He heard a soft chuckle followed by silence. You not plain speaks? Not sure what he was hoping to see, he walked over to the urn and looked inside the ashes. Nothing moved, no voice rose to advise him. He waited a moment and gave up. He'd probably imagine Willie's voice. Anybody would get a little crazy under the circumstances. The barn door rattled and Ava opened it. She held a steaming bowl in one hand and a cup in the other. Feeding time at the zoo legs, she said, come on down. He did as she said and was handed coffee and oatmeal. Eat it. That's as good as it gets. When you're done... You'll feed the herd and clean up the shit. She wrinkled her nose. Stinks in here. He took the meal and stepped carefully towards the outdoors. She shook her head and relented. Okay, but don't try anything. She was back in fatigues, a whistle hanging from her neck and her pistol prominently displayed. He had no doubt she knew how to use it. After he had gratefully eaten the oatmeal, he lit a cigarette, counted how many had left and sipped the coffee. It was surprisingly good. I used to read stuff about UFO around here. There's a website, ufomind.com. Sends me all kinds of information. 
Know anything about that? Ava shrugged. The site's a mailing list for UFO and conspiracy nuts, and it's being cut off on December 18th. That's all I know. It has nothing to do with my job. What is your job? And what the hell do I have to do with any of this? I guess it's time I tell you. Remember that dead body you found in the elevator at Country Club Towers? And the fix-it man who died in your apartment? I'm not likely to forget. What do you think killed them? Legs remembered the double gouges in each of the men's belly and the blood. Not a pleasant sight. I have no idea. Cops said it must be some kind of gang ritual. Probably the 28th Street Gang? No. Who then? You mean, what? Legs was getting annoyed and not a little antsy. Ava continued. Didn't you read about the ostriches? The way they can kick a man? No way. Yes way. Willie's guide did a perfect job. How? Listen to me. This is serious stuff. A military experiment. We hope to turn the herd into special ops assassins. They'll be shipped to the Middle East to mingle with the camels and get the terrorists. They're being programmed. Leg started to laugh. He couldn't help himself. What a gig. It was crazier than he was. And my job is, he asked, when he calmed down. Like I said, you feed them, clean up after them. You saw the syringe I had yesterday. They each get one of those every day. Operation Ostrich, like said. When is this supposed to happen? Think millennium. If I go along with it, there ain't no if, kid. Now get moving. After what was likely the worst day of his life, Legs returned to his mattress. For most of that night and the next, he formulated a plan. For the third day, he worked out the details. On New Year's Eve, he and as many of his ostrich buddies as he could muster would be off and running, not to the Middle East, but to the center of Las Vegas. He'd need to pick the ones who were in heat as his dancers. Until then, the trick was to stay alive. It took Legs another three days to get up the nerve to speak to Ava. He waited for breakfast the only time he could actually talk to Ava and put the beginnings of his plan into motion. What's your take on the Yucca Mountain nuclear waste debate? Excuse me? Seriously, Leg said. Does anything about it impact our, um, squadron? What do you think? Leg's answer had to come out just right. He took his time. I think you want to use the ostriches to deliver dirty bombs from the Yucca Mountain nuclear waste to terrorist encampments. Ava stared at him. You're not as dumb as you look, Legs Cleveland, she said and spoke of something else. After a few more days, Legs said more confidently, I've been thinking about something we have to do with the soldiers. They need a trial run to see how they do as a team. All of them? Not possible. Right. But what about five or six? What do you have in mind? Legs took a deep breath. Ever seen the Radio City Rockets, he asked. She nodded. Of course I have. Think I've lived all of my life out here in the boondocks? Good. Then think about this. On New Year's Eve day, there's going to be a major protest at Cashman Field against the Yucca Mountain Project. What if we dress our soldiers as rockets and march them to town to pull off the project? They'll get all of the attention. Ava laughed long and hard. Then suddenly she was quiet. After several minutes, she said, Be a lot of major politicians there and a couple of bands and fireworks. Legs merely nodded. The following morning, Ava reopened the subject. Can you have them trained in time, she asked. Sure, no problem. And you'll need what from me? I'll need costumes so we can dress them like the Rockettes. One for you, too, if you want to dance with them. She smiled. Told you I'd make you a star, Legs said. And so the preparations began. When the day came, everything was ready. Legs patted his pocket making sure he hadn't forgotten Uncle Willie, whom he poured into a baggie, fearing the old man wouldn't want to miss the show. With Ava's help, he piled five rockets into a large van with the back seats removed. He found two couples and a fifth who made everything possible. Uncle Willie's spirit guide, with whose help he taught them high kicks and tried to shuffle off to Buffalo, though without much success. Truth was, all he wanted was to cause enough of a ruckus to give him enough cover to leave town. He hadn't yet decided whether to sprinkle Willie on a poker table en route. Legs sat in the back with the ostriches, each of which wore a banner reading, Welcome to Yucca Mountain. Ava drove, looking stunning in her costume. When they got downtown to Cashman Field, 
Ava drove them through several roadblocks with a flash of her credentials. Parked near the loading docks, they assembled a troop. When they were all set, they walked past hot dog stands and popcorn vendors. The soldiers would love the popcorn, he thought, as they headed into the stadium, where a local band played loud rock, holding the attention of most of the security personnel assigned to the event. While Ava and the ostriches waited in what was the visiting team's dugout when the Las Vegas 51s were playing baseball, legs bounded onto the stage in the echoing last notes of one of the interchangeable rock anthems he aboard. Taking the microphone, he said, Thank you, thank you, and now a special surprise performance. The strains of the March of the Wooden Soldiers started to play over the loudspeakers, and Ava high-stepped out of the dugout, followed by the five costume ostriches. As they reached the center of the field, the birds began a strange dance around the woman. Watching her gorgeous gams move in time to the music, Legs almost forgot to edge his way towards the home team's dugout, where he could make good his escape. The crowd at first stunned into silence began to cheer and laugh. Legs felt rather than heard Uncle Willie's voice slip from his pocket, up to his neck and into his ear. Run, Legs, it whispered. But he was rooted to the ground. With enormous effort, he moved one foot, then the other. Legs moved faster now. He reached the steps of the field and took the bag out of his pocket. It stuck to his fingers. Legs peeled it off his hand, along with a layer of skin. Thank you, Nati Toketa, he said. He looked at his troop. Something was amiss. Ava twirled and pointed at a set of box seats behind home plate. He recognized several prominent senators from nearby states standing there, all of whom were staunchly opposed to the use of Yucca Mountain as a nuclear storage facility. That was when the ostriches abandoned the dance Legs had taught them and ran, head on in a vicious assault. Blood and brains flew into the crowds, raining onto the first few rows. In his ear, he heard Uncle Willie's voice clearer than the screams and the music. I told you not to screw with my spirit guide, nephew. From the middle of the carnage, an ostrich, its red and white costume smeared with gore, came charging toward legs. It's still my guide, Willie's voice said. Throw me away, and it'll come to me. An Indian war cry rose above the sounds of death and legs was shocked to realize it came from his own throat. He flung the ashes into the path of the oncoming bird. It grabbed the baggie from the air in its beak, stopped and whipped around, showering Willie onto the ground, on top of the peanut shells and popcorn and political flyers. Legs turned to run and never looked back. A Very Special Girl, A Harry the Book Story by Mike Resnick I'm reading the daily racing form in my temporary office, which is the third booth at Joey Chicago's Three Star Tavern, coming to the conclusion that six trillion to one on flyaway in the fifth at Saratoga is a bit of an underlay, as there is no way this horse gets within twenty lengths of the winner on a fast track, a slow track, or a muddy track, and I have my doubts that even a rain of toads moves him up more than two lengths. I conclude that this horse cannot beat a blind sea slug at equal weights even if he has the inside post position. Suddenly, a strange odor strikes my nostrils, and without looking up I say, Hi, Dead End, because one whiff tells me that it is Dead End Dugan, who simply cannot hide the fact that he is a zombie. He is also an occasional employee that I use when some gonif does not wish to honor his marker, and indeed, he has just returned from Longshot's Lamont's, where I had sent him to collect the three large that Longshot Lamont bent on Auntie's panties to come in first. And indeed, a filly does come in first by seven length, but she comes in first in the eighth rate after she goes to the post in the seventh race thirty minutes earlier. So, do you pick up the three large that Harry the Book is owed? asks Benny Fifth Street. Of course he picks it up, sent gently, gently Dawkins. After all, he is half as big as a mountain and is covered by almost as much dirt, and how much can three large weigh anyway? They immediately get into one of their arguments. Gently Gently says that a $3,000 diamond weighs less than a cigarette, and Benny replying that it all depends who is manning the scales, and that his cousin is a clerk of scales at Belmont, and has been weighing Flyboy Billy Tuesday in at 120 pounds every day for years, even though the Flyboy has not topped 108 pounds since eating some bad chili three years ago. This drives Joey Chicago, who has been standing behind the bar wild, because he has been betting against Flyboy Billy Tuesday's horses all year, and now he learns that they've been carrying 12 pounds less than they should. 
but Benny points out that it's okay because 108 pounds of Billy Tuesday is more of a handicap to a horse than 130 pounds of most jockeys. And Joey Chicago has no answer for this, so he goes back to cleaning the bar around Dead and Dugan, which requires cleaning every time Dugan moves. So does Longshot Lamont pay with a smile, I ask Dugan? He gives me that puzzled expression he doesn't think as clearly as he used to before he became a zombie. And he says, I thought you wanted money, Harry. Money is even better than smiles, I say to comfort him, and because it is also true. I trust you have it with you. Well, I had it, says Dugan. I was going to say, says Dugan uncomfortably, but the fact of the matter is that nothing makes him more uncomfortable than being dead, which is a permanent, if not a stationary, condition. If you do not have it any more, you had better tell me where it is and why it is not in my hand right now, I say. I am in love, says Dugan. I meet the most wonderful girl this afternoon on my way back from Longshot Lamont's. Is this not a bit early in the relationship for an exchange of three thousand dollar gifts? asks gently, gently. Do not be so fast to misinterpret, replies Dugan. This girl is just half a step short of perfection. Then she will understand that that was not your money to give, and she will be happy to hand it over to me, I say. Uh, that is the half step I was referring to, says Dugan, brushing away flies that are starting to play field hockey on his face, as they always do when he stands in one place for a few minutes. I decide to be the reasoning father figure, partially because I'm a saint among men, and primarily because I have not yet figured out how to threaten a man who is already dead. And I say, tell us about this remarkable lady who has won your heart. She has left my heart right where it has always been, answers Dugan. She is much more interested in my brain and my soul. I can't imagine why, says Benny. You never use the one, and you are no longer in possession of the other. She is kind of a collector, explains Dugan, and it is the first time in my life I ever see a zombie swallow uneasily, or swallow at all for that matter. What does she collect, brains or souls? asks Benny, who has a healthy curiosity about such things. I get the impression that she is not all that choosy, answers Dugan. Where do you meet her? I ask. I am passing Creepy Conrad's curiosity shop, and I see her through the window, nibbling on a little snack in a feminine way, and it is love at first sight. What kind of snack? asked gently, gently, who at 350 pounds and counting has a serious interest in such things. I cannot see through the window, replies Dugan, but it is wiggling its tail just before she swallows it. But she swallows it in a feminine way, I say, though my sarcasm is lost on Dugan. Yes, he says, she's just beautiful and very precise. Why, she drains an entire fifth of Comrade Terrorist Vodka and does not spill so much as a drop. I figure the tale accompanies both ears of whatever it was apprised of her feminine appetites, says Benny. She should skip the Olympics and go pro, adds gently, gently. Does she eat anything else we should know about, I ask? Like what, asks Dugan. Like small children, I say, or even big ones? You are speaking of the woman I love, says Dugan heatedly. I am speaking of the woman who is holding three large that belongs to me, I say. Maybe you should introduce me to both of them. Both? asked Dugan. Your girl and my money, I say. I will take it from there. All right, says Dugan. I'm dying to see her again anyway. Poor choice of words, notes Joey Chicago from behind the bar. But you have to approach her gently, Harry, continues Dugan, ignoring Joey's unfeeling if accurate remark. She is a sensitive thing and takes offense easily. I will approach her so gently, she will hardly know I'm there, I assure him. She will know, he assures me. She is very perceptive, he pauses. I think it is the extra pair of eyes. She has four eyes, I ask. At the very least, says Dugan. Has she got four of anything else important? Asked Benny, suddenly interested. She comes equipped with all kinds of extra, says Dugan. This is why I have fallen in love with her. She is unique, even among women, who are all unique, each in their own alien way. What kind of extras, I ask? Teeth, says Dugan. Claws, eyes, tails. 
Well, it is only one tail, but compared to everyone else, it is extra. Cannot argue with that, agrees Benny. And how many women can lift an entire car, says Dugan proudly. Six cylinders or eight, asks Gently Gently. Why would she lift a car, chimes in Benny. It is a very tight parking space, so she just walks out, picks up the car, driver and all, and sets it down in the empty space. Dugan smiles wistfully and she does not even break a sweat. I agree that she's unique among all the women of my acquaintances, I say. Right up to the incident with the car, she is running neck and neck with a redhead named Thelma, but she has sprinted into the lead. That is nothing, says Dugan. You should see her fly. Probably I shouldn't, I say. I have enough trouble falling asleep as it is. She just flaps her arms and flies away, asks Benny. Dugan smiles. It is maybe the first smile anyone has seen on him since he came back from the grave. Nobody can flap their arms and fly, he says. She flaps her wings. Does she imbibe anything besides vodka while you are with her, I ask suddenly. Like what? says Dugan. Like blood, I say. I will not dignify such a crude question with a response, respond Dugan. I doubt that there can be more than one of her, I say. But just in case God has been asleep at the switch and there are two or more, what is she wearing so I will be able to identify her? I will be right alongside you, Harry, he replies. True, but you are still a relative newcomer to the zombie trade. And what if you suddenly decide you don't like it? If I am to present a moldering corpse to the lady of your dreams, I at least should be sure I have the right lady. So, what is she wearing? I don't know, says Dugan. I am so enraptured by her face. I never notice. Now I know for sure he's a zombie, says Benny. All right, I say, trying to hide my annoyance. What color is her hair? That's kind of difficult to say. How hard can it be, I persist. It is blonde, brunette, or possibly red. Well, it wiggles and hisses a lot, and it keeps changing colors under the lights, answers Dugan. Sometimes it is red and sometimes it is green. I do not think it is ever blonde, but I could be wrong. Are you saying she's a Medusa, I ask? No, I am not saying any such thing, answers Dugan. For one thing, her hair is friendly. How can hair be friendly? asks Gently Gently. It chats with me, and it sings 99 bottles of beer on the wall while she's drinking the vodka. You talk to her hair? says Benny disbelievingly. No, answers Dugan. Then you just made that up? says Benny. I made nothing up, says Dugan sharply. Her hair chats with me, just like I say, but I do not talk to it because I'm shy and tongue-tied in her presence. So she has extra eyes and teeth and comes equipped with wings and a cold-blooded hairdo. I say, I hope you will not take it askance, Dugan, but I think I'm going to bring a little protection along. A gun, he asks. I shake my head. I have a feeling that a hail of bullets would just annoy her. I say, no. I will take big-hearted Milton. I do not see him, says Dugan, looking around. That is because you are not looking in his office, I say. I will go and fetch him. And with that, I walk to the men's room and enter it, and there is big-hearted Milton, my personal mage, sitting in his usual spot on the top floor, surrounded by five black candles, which have all burned down to nubs. Hi, Harry, he says. Be with you in a minute. He mutters a spell that has very little metal and even fewer vowels, as he says the last word of it, all five candles go out. That'll show her, he says with a satisfied smile. What will show who? Mitzi Mitzqueenie, says Milton. I take her to dinner last night, and just because I play a little itsy bitsy spider on her thigh under the table, she throws her soup in my face and walks out. He glowers furiously, and I do not even like chicken gumbo. What have you done to the poor girl, I ask? When she steps on the scale this morning, vain creature that she is, she will find out that she is ten pounds heavier than last night, and nothing will take the weight off except an apologetic phone call to me. I decide not to point out that Mitzi is bordering on anorexic anyway, and an extra ten pounds will fill her out nicely. I especially decide not to mention that she can probably pack more of a wallop at 115 pounds than at 105. Okay, Milton, I say. If you are done with your just and terrible vengeance, I have need of your services. I am the best there is at my trade, he says. I put Morris the mage in the shade. 
spell-seeing your soul cannot hold a candle to me. But I tell you up front, Harry, that even I cannot bring Flyaway home a winner at Saratoga tomorrow. I could put a saddle on you, and you could spot him eight lengths and still beat him by daylight. That is not the particular service I need, I say. It seems that Dead and Dugan has fallen in love, and has given his lady friend the three large that he picked up for me from Longshot Lamont. It is my intention to retrieve it. And you need my help taking your money back from a girl? laughs Milton. Anything is possible, I say. Oh, well. I have not been out of my office since I showed up to wash the soup off my face last night. He says, a little fresh air will do me good. And getting your money back should be like taking candy from a baby. I resist the urge to ask him, a baby what? And a moment later we emerge from the men's room into the bar and pick up Dead and Dugan, Benny Fifth Street and Gently Gently Dawkins, and we're about to walk out the door when Milton asks Dugan what the name of the lady we are about to visit might be. Anna, he says. And her last name is Conda, right? says Milton, laughing at his own joke. How did you know? asks Dugan. Creepy Conrad's curiosity shop is easy to find. You just see where all the terrified women and children are running away from and follow screaming to its source. On the day we go there, Conrad is having a sale on shrunken heads, but these differ from every other shrunken head I have ever seen in that they are still alive and are attached to non-shrunken bodies. They spend most of their time eating because their mouths are so small and their bodies are so big. Because he is on the outskirts of an Italian neighborhood, Conrad also sells a lot of full-size wooden crosses with or without hammers and nails. His vinyl record section, he has not yet made the jump to CDs, sells mood music, providing that your mood is either morbid or panic-stricken. He's also having a special on surplus dialysis machines, and three pale, lean gentlemen, each wearing a velvet cape, are examining them. The rest of the merchandise is really esoteric, especially the part that is still live. But we have not come to enjoy a pleasant afternoon browsing through Conrad's stock. We have come for Anaconda and my $3,000. But as I look around, there is no morsel of femininity to be seen, nor is there anyone who matches Anna's description. Finally, Creepy Conrad emerges from back room. He is missing one eye, and his left cheekbone protrudes through the skin, and those few teeth he still possesses are filed and discolored, and the nails on his hands are about an inch long and curved like those of a leopard. But aside from that, he looks every bit as normal as Dead and Dugan, which is perhaps not really an apt comparison as Dugan still possesses his hair. Well, curse my soul if it isn't Harry the book and his retainer, says Conrad. What may I do for you fine gentlemen today? Could I perhaps interest the illustrious Mr. Dugan in a coffin? You can interest me no matter where you were, says Dugan. We have come to see the delectable Anaconda. Well, there is an Anaconda on the premises, answers Conrad, but a delectable one? Possibly you want Madame Bonamy's house of exotic comforts for the recently departed. They might have one. Watch your step, sir, says Dugan, drawing himself up to his full height. You are speaking of the woman I love. Now, why would the woman you love be working for Madame Bonamy? muses Conrad. Keep a civil tongue in your head, says Dugan ominously. I already have one, says Conrad, sticking his tongue out at us. It belonged to a little old lady. He only used it in church on Sundays. Where is she, demands Dugan. The little old lady, says Conrad. She is long gone. Where is Anaconda, says Dugan. I heard you mention my name, says a voice that sounds kind of like a wired-haired terrier being combed against the grain. And a moment later, Anaconda steps out from one of the back rooms. She is everything Dugan says she is. But Dugan does not say the half of it. He never mentioned the gold reptilian eyes, the pointed ears, the reticulated greenish skin, or the four-inch dew claws on each of her ankles. She offers us the kind of smile healthy cats offer to three-legged mice, and I can see that her tongue is black and forked. Hello, Mr. Dugan, she says, and her voice does not improve with proximity. How nice to see you again. You're even more beautiful than before, replies Dugan, and Benny shoots me a look at says, My God! What does she look like earlier in the day? Who are your friends? asks Anna. This is Harry the Book, my sometimes employer, says Dugan before I can whisper to him to make up a name. And these are Benny Fitzstreet, Gently Gently Dawkins, and Big Hearted Milton. And what are you gentlemen here for? she asks. 
It is Harry's fault, Dugan blurts out, so I figure I had better explain the situation. It would appear that Dugan, with the best will in the world, gives you a little keepsake that is not his to give, I say. I'm just as happy to accept it from you, Harry, she says with a smile that makes me want to turn and race for the door and not stop running until I have reached Des Moines or Des Plaines or some other distant municipality, beginning with Des. I will handle this, Harry, says Milton, stepping forward. Miss Conda, charming and beautiful as you are, I'm afraid I must insist that you return the three large to Harry, though you can keep a couple of Ben Franklins for your trouble. It was given to me in all earnestness, and I am not inclined to give it back, she says, and I notice that blue vapor is starting to pour out of her nose, which means that either she's losing her temper, or perhaps her spleen has spontaneously combusted, and I will give heavy odds on the former. Then I am afraid I shall have to resort to stringent means of recovering, says Milton. You do that, says Anna. Very well, says Milton. Do not say that you weren't warned. And with that, Milton begins chanting something in a forgotten language, and making gestures in the air and otherwise conjuring up all of the black arts at his command, and finally ends it with a cry of, Presto! And suddenly there are only four of us facing Anaconda, and big-hearted Milton is nowhere to be seen. Where did he go? asked gently, gently. Beats me, I say. Get me the hell out of here, says Milton's voice. I look around, but there is no sign of him. Get you out of where, I ask. This damned dimension that she hurls me into, says Milton's voice. And hurry, it is cold, and there's something very big sniffing at me and drooling on my face. I do not know how to magic you back, I say. After all, you are the mage. Reach out and grab my hand, of course, says Milton. Reach where, I say. Out, yells Milton. I reach my hand out, and sure enough, a pudgy, invisible hand takes hold of it. I give it a pull, and suddenly there is a pop, and then Milton is standing next to me, looking both relieved and annoyed. He stares at Anaconda with a combination of fear and awe. Who does your protection, he asks. Whoever it is, he's good. I need no protector, answers Anna. I can believe it, says Benny fervently. Enough of this chit-chat, I say. I still want my money. Dugan walks over and stands next to Anna. Enough, he says. I will not stand idly by and let you pester the love of my life. Actually, she is more the love of your death, gently, gently points out. Whatever she is, I say, I am not inclined to supply her with a dowry one hour after collecting it from Longshot Lamont. I turn to her. I hope you and Dugan will be very happy and can find a hotel that caters to both of whatever you are, and I'll even pop for a flimsy nightgown if you're going to tie the knot. But I still want my three large. And if I do not agree to part with it, will you put a hit out on Dead and Dugan? She asked with a cold reptilian smile. I have to admit that the idea of putting out a hit on a dead man can best be called counterproductive. Milton, I say, have you got any other tricks up your sleeve? He has nothing up his sleeve except his arms, says Anna, and if he tries anything he will make me lose my temper. You will not be happy if I should lose my temper. The last time I lose it, they blame what happens on Hurricane Katrina, and the time before that they invent Hurricane Andrew. Did you do this Chernobyl too? asked Benny curiously. No, she says, that was my kid's sister. I am sure I will love her too, says Dugan. No sooner do the words leave his mouth than Anna gets all red in the face and lets out a shriek. All the windows break, my feelings fall out of my teeth, a bus half a block away veers and plows into fire hydrant and every dog within a mile begins howling. I am sorry, says Anna a moment later, I have a jealous and passionate nature. To say nothing of cataclysmic and catastrophic and a lot of other words that begin with cat, I agree. I see your friend is sprawled out on the floor, she says, indicating gently, gently. I hope I did not do him irreparable damage. If he can survive 87 million calories, I say, as Benny and I heave him to his feet, he can survive a jealous scream. Where am I? mumbles gently, gently. Are we at war? What day is it? Wait! I have it. Fly away one, and the world came to an end. You'll be all right, I say. Just stand there and try not to think. That should be very easy for him, says Benny. Not thinking is one of the things gently, gently does best. Anaconda turns to Dugan. I am sorry I have upset your friend so much. I cherish our relationship, and to prove it, I will return Harry the Book's money. Well, those are words I have been longing to hear, answers Dugan. The part about cherishing our relationship... Not the best about Harry's money. I'm mildly surprised, as our total time spent in each other's company has been only ten minutes, give or take. 
That is about seven minutes longer than most of my relationships last, says Anna. I will be back with the money in a moment. She goes into one of the back rooms and Benny walks over to Dugan. I'll be very careful with this girl, he says confidentially. For example, when she suggests you go out for a bite, I will go plenty of eight to five that she is not talking about patronizing a restaurant. Anna comes out and hands me a bag containing the three thousand dollars. It is all there, she says. You can count it if you wish. That is not necessary, I tell her. Dugan would never cheat me, and if you would, I prefer not to know about it, because then I will not have to do anything about it. She gives me another of those smiles that are more frightening than a Gorgon's grimace. You are wise beyond your years, Harry the Book, and you are formidable beyond yours, Anaconda. I say bowing low, but not so low that I can't jump back if she changes her mind or reaches for the money, or maybe my neck. Are we leaving, Benny whispers to me. I know love is blind, but until this minute, I do not realize he is on life support. And that is the story of Dead and Dugan's very special girl. I suppose her relationship was doomed from the start. I know that opposites attract, but there is nothing in the rule book about anyone quite as opposite as Dugan and Anna. They decide to go away for a weekend in the mountains. Dugan never mentions exactly what happens, except that he makes a mistake by remarking that the tour bus driver is very pretty. But I am told that when the next edition of Ram McNally comes out, Pike's Peak will now be Pike's Valley. I have learned a valuable lesson, Harry. Dugan tells me when it is all over. From now on, I will stick to my own kind. And so he does. The next afternoon, I am sitting in the third booth at Joey Chicago's, reading the form, and the smell of rotting flesh is twice as strong as ever. I look up, and there is Dugan and his new girlfriend sidling up to the bar. What can I get you and this beautiful young lady? asked Joey Chicago managing to string together three misstatements in just three words. "'What will it be, my dear?' says Dugan. "'It's been so many decades since I've drunk anything at all I can't remember,' says his companion. "'Why don't we let the bartender decide?' "'I've got just a thing,' says Joey Chicago, pulling out a pair of tall glasses and little paper umbrellas. "'And what is that?' asks Dugan. "'A pair of zombies,' says Joey Chicago.'